The Lord be with you. We celebrate this as our last Green Sunday, really, until June. We prepare to enter in this Wednesday into Lent, our 40 days of Lent and our 50 days of Easter, which really enter into the central kind of myst Christian mystery of the resurrection, the death, the resurrection, the preparation, and the new life. To enter and meditate deeply on this mystery again that's at the heart of uh, the faith, our faith in Christ. It's a time to gather together our different um, goals, both personally and yeah, I think in a larger way. You know, we have a couple of these celebrations. It'll be our last Sunday, we'll sing the Gloria for a while. The last Sunday, we'll sing Alleluia uh, until we get to Easter. But to ask the Lord as we enter into that time again of more focused reflection and preparation for His grace and His blessing. And so, brothers and sisters, we take a moment as we call to mind our sins to help to prepare us to celebrate these sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you raise us to new life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You forgive us our sins. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You feed us with your body and blood. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. shall keep his garments rent 
and his head bare, and shall muffle his beard. He shall cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as the sore is on him, he shall declare himself unclean, since he is in fact unclean. <clears throat> he shall dwell apart, making his abode outside the camp. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The responsorial psalm, I turn to you, Lord, in time of trouble, and you fill me with the joy of salvation. I turn to you, Lord, Lord in time of trouble, and you fill me with his salvation. Blessed is he whose fault is taken away, whose sin is covered. Bless the man who, to whom the Lord imputes not guilt, in whom spirit there is no God. I turn to you, Lord, Lord, in time of trouble. Then I acknowledge my sin to you, my guilt I covered not. I said, I conf confess my faults to the Lord, and you took away the guilt of my sin. I turn to you, O Lord, I'm a girl, and you know me through the Lord of my salvation. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you just. Exult, all you upright of heart. I turn to you, O Lord, I turn to the Lord. And you will be the of salvation. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do everything for the glory of God. Avoid giving offense, whether to the Jews or Greeks or the Church of God, just as I try to please everyone in every way, not seeking my own benefit, but that of the many that they may be saved. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I don't really like, I didn't really like writing papers. That's something like in school and exams and things like that. It's something that was never that interesting to me. It was very challenging, a lot of work. I didn't really know what I was in for with seminary, realizing that in you know, seminary you had to do both a philosophy and master's degree which in, in theology, which was mainly writing papers. <laughs> paper after paper after paper after paper. The worst of all, of course, was at the end. We had what they call our master thesis, the long paper that was expected to be at least 50 pages. 
And just looking forward to that was not something that excited me or gave me much, uh, uh, what's the right word, like enthusiasm about getting to the end of the, the course of studies there. But what I realized kind of needed was imagination. That what I needed to do was find something that really was interesting to me that was going to be the only thing that could sustain the effort and the work of the research and the revisions and the editing and all the other things that go into writing papers. That needed that gift of imagination to kind of look and see, you know, what is something that's interesting? <laughs> How can I find a way to research that, research what interests me, that will then again give me the strength to kind of keep the work or the difficult aspects of it? That there's a lot more, and I won't, I don't want to get into the whole tangent about that paper, but I ended up finishing it barely, like a week ahead of time, so it, it worked out. But the, um, it involved looking at the, about different writers on the priesthood. And I figured, well, I'm preparing to be a priest. That <laughs> seems like a good thing to spend extra time reflecting on. And it was. It was a good combination. That the things I studied and read and researched, you'll help to reflect on. One of the things of that was writings from the Second Vatican Council. That was kind of the beginning. So it was kind of a historical thing where I looked at four different things. So the first one was on that. And what kind of sparked interest in that, or I should say the part of that study that sparked interest and in, in reflection for me was the way that it connected three different ideas. There was just to see kind of how these three ideas came through in a number of different writings from the Second Vatican Council on um, the mission of the priesthood. And it was really that there is a consecration that's for a mission, and that mission is building communion. So what does that mean? That consecration, which in the case of priesthood is ordination, but in every Christian, baptism uh, is strengthened and confirmation, that there's a blessing that's given. But that blessing isn't just for a person's kind of own comfort or purpose, or selfish purpose, but it's for a mission. This is what St. Paul says in the second reading, that he didn't receive this for his own benefit, but to go out for the good of others. That there is a mission, a dynamic, a drive to what we receive. That there is a push against what might be called maintenance mode. That we're called to mission. That we're called to go out. This is one of the kind of key themes of the Second Vatican Council. Calling to go into the modern world and bring this mission. And what's a way to kind of articulate the mission of Christ? And it uses the concept again and again of communion, of building communion. Communion is about relationship. That this is the core of the mission, to heal the broken relationship, not just between God and human beings, but among human beings. And the gospel today, this is why it comes to my mind in one way, is because Jesus here is restoring communion. Restoring communion to this leper that is cut off because of sickness from others. Of course, he first is restored to union with God through Christ, and then sent out to return back to people, to others, to build communion. This is relevant in many ways, again, because it's a way of looking at the mission of the church in general. How do we build up that? So, of course, the sacraments and prayer, particular moments to build up our communion with God, but that they also should inspire in us that, um, that mission. That we need that gift of imagination again to look and see and, and translate that, to look forward to what can be. That then through works of mercy, through service, you know, building up that communion with others, going out. Um, that it's relevant because, of course, in the time of the pandemic, we find that as with the Old Testament and leprosy here, there is that separation among people. That it's a particular time for us to imagine and use our imagination and creativity to think, how do we build communion with God and communion with others going forward? We're almost to a year since the stay-at-home order and everything. Um, how do we learn and look forward with that? And so I think kind of a third application is, this is the topic of what I really want to do with our reflections for Lent and Easter this year. Because we have about 90 days, 40 days of Lent, 50 days of Easter, with a few special days thrown in, but about 90 days to really reflect. And the theme of the reflections are imagination and action. Imagination is that power where we can take the things we know, kind of deconstruct them and put them back in other ways. Like we can take apart a puzzle and you know, rearrange the pieces to make something new. Though not with real puzzles, I guess, but figuratively speaking. Normally puzzles only go together one way, that's kind of the whole point. But our imagination lets us do a different thing with reality. 
Again, it lets us look at reality, look at the things we know, kind of look at the ways they connect, and look at ways that they can connect um, in different ways. It's a way to help us uh, prepare for the future. And it's also, again, kind of like I said, with writing papers, I think important to motivate. Because if all it is is to say, there's more stuff we need to do, that can not be, that can be a cru maybe a crushing thought. That often people may feel that they're already at their wit's end, they're at the, um, the capacity. And that without imagination, looking to the future might just seem like, again, more work, more things to do. That we need that spark of imagination first to be excited about how our life might be different. To be excited about how things could change for the better. That we then have that energy and that strength to invest in the things that can help to build that. That for us in the, the spiritual life, we believe you know, that with God, there enters a capacity for more life, more strength. If we're to fill up our gas tank and drive 400 miles, we're going to find that our gas tank is getting close to empty maybe depending on, I guess, how efficient your car is. But the grace of God enters a different equation in. You know, to be able to drive and find that your gas tank is more full than it used to be is an impossibility in nature. In nature, we have diminishing returns. In nature, we have the law of just kind of uh, conservation of energy, that there's not an increase of it. But that with faith, Christ proclaims the mystery of the resurrection. That with grace there's this possibility of a new force entering from outside the normal equation that can counteract that law of diminishing returns, of, of uh, new life entering in. So that mystery that devoting ourselves to the work of prayer can bring more energy than it takes. Devoting ourselves to love of neighbor, people say, I get more than I give you know, so often. But the challenge is that it often is not the case of one day. <laughs> there are going to be days when it asks things of us, um, and that we maybe feel like we are on the, the negative end, that law of diminishing returns. But that in the end, the confidence Christ uh, asks us to have is that God is not outdone in generosity. So, again, I think for us, as we go into Lent, as we prepare this week, these are kind of the ideas I hope that we can kind of have in mind. To first to ask the Lord for that gift of allowing that power of imagination to enter in reflection about our life and our, our mission, to look at the way that we've been blessed. The sacraments, you know, kind of that sacramental consecration through baptism, confirmation, but then in the many other ways that we've received blessings. To say, Lord, how do I turn this to mission? Again, particularly seeing that mission as building communion. Communion first of ourself with God, and then through Christ's redemption, communion with others. Having confidence as we do that, asking him to give us that spark of strength, to give us that spark of encouragement, to see what it is that this is a path he's not asking just for us to do more stuff, more burdens, you know, more challenges, but to bring new life, that he wants to, to bring his grace into the equation to, to change things. Asking the Lord for inspiration for our own self, for our whole parish, for our world, of that grace of imagination and action of God's work in, con in cooperation with our creativity.